you about Dr. Kelly Cross. She is a well-known pediatrician, as many of you know, in this area for over 24 years. And she is bringing to you today to talk about how uh, food can be actually either medicine or just supplement your child's growth both um, mentally and physically. So welcome Dr. Cross, we would like to thank you. So I've done these talks for about 10 years and this one is my baby. You know, my other talks were geared more towards, which they were great and I'm proud of them in terms of, you know, kids who had learning differences or kids who had ADHD, but I feel like the message from this is really something everybody should learn and everyone should know, so I'm just super proud of it. And of note, I always try to have like the slides, at least the first slides have meaning. That picture of the um, vegetables is an urban farm that's a cooperative project between my church, St. Augustine's, and St. Thomas Episcopal, and they grow organic, um, produce and donate it to food pantries. So if anyone's interested in urban farming, it's called Medicine Farm, and we're always looking for teenagers to dig in the dirt and help us, so people need ours. But um, but that's, my feeling is they're part of the answer to what the message is. So, so really the theme of this is, we know that you know how you eat can prevent heart disease and can prevent diabetes, but you know can it treat certain conditions? And that's really the um, part of the food is medicine movement. So nutritional psychiatry is a, again a new movement, and that's psychiatrists that go to medical school become psychiatrists, but instead of you going to see them and they write a script or just you know put you on prescription medications, they actually change and alter your diet to help with psych psychiatric illnesses and. Um, Really, you know, when I first heard about this, I'm like, oh, it's like Tree Hunter University. This is Harvard. The lady at Harvard and at Mass General is really the, the founder of nutritional psychiatry and it's taking off in the country. And then there's integrative medicine. So um, what is integrative medicine? It's, it's different than traditional medicine. Traditional medicine you know, is, is really owned by insurance companies and big pharma. And, and as far as big pharma goes, you know, they'll take a group of people and there's 10,000 of them. 5,000 take the drug, and 5,000 take the sugar pill, and if those 5,000 get better, well then that's what works on everybody. Integrated medicine is different. It's really about the individual. It's that everyone is unique genetically, biochemically, so it's really trying to figure out all the nuances that are unique to that individual. And it's focused really on healing instead of treatment. It treats the whole patient, so instead of just, okay, you have this problem and this is how we treat it, it's do you sleep and do you exercise? And, you know, how much do you, especially if kids get exposed to electronic devices, it's looking at the whole lifestyle, looking at the whole picture, and trying to help that individual. So how I got here. Um, I have a new practice that is um, a direct primary care practice, but it's also a, a main reason that I formed this with Dr. Loeb was to do integrative care. Um, about, um, about five years ago, I have a friend who does um, integrative care and she does really just integrative care for people who are special needs. And we did residency together, I ran into her in a girl's trip, she was practicing in Puerto Rico like 10 years ago and we were sitting on the beach and she was I mean, she was saying how she works with kids with special needs, kids who have ADHD, kids who have autism. And I was like, oh my gosh, you do the same thing, you know, this parent group, I'm so proud of myself. And you know, I really learned so much and I treated it, but she kind of looked at me, she's like, well that's because you just don't know any better. She's like, I really heal them. And I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so and I love her. She's like my sister. So, but, and now I think back, I was like, she was right. You know, I did just treat them because that's really all I knew how to do. So I had probably you know, five or six years ago, my most severely autistic patient, and he was sick. He was so close to being institutionalized on so many drugs, sick all the time, physically just had pus pouring out of his ears. Um, just couldn't get better, and the family had resources. Mom had become an ABA therapist. They were trying everything they could to help him, and I was like, well, you know, here's my friend Carmen's number, and she's a, you know, I, she's a safe dog. She's not gonna do anything crazy. I know that she still believes in vaccinations, and she still won't do anything that would harm your child, but see, and she worked him up, and it took time, but he started getting better, and that was five years ago, and he is off all of his antipsychotics, and really the things that she did were changes in diet and supplementation and things that I researched that I found in the NIH and in the regular um, literature. It's just not stuff that's promoted regularly. And so I started going to conferences with her because I was like, that's amazing to see this kid get so much better with really kind of simple things. So that's what took me down the food is medicine path. So I talk about how it's 
you know, a new movement, but really, Hippocrates, this is 440 BC. Our food should be our medicine, and our medicine should be our food. So, you know, the founding father of modern medicine really had it right. We kind of went astray. So, here's the bad news. The standard American diet, I always say, is SAD or SAD. 75% of Americans have diets that are low in vegetables and fruits. 70% uh, of Americans exceed recommended amounts of sugar, saturated fats, and sodium. And the worst news is that it impacts our physical and our mental health, especially children. That processed food interferes with absorption of key nutrients. Dyes cause hyperactivity. I said in my talk with the uh, teachers that I never would volunteer on Valentine's Day because the red dye made all the kids crazy, but I never volunteered on Valentine's Day. <laughs> but, but they do, they cause neurovegetation. And if you look at Europe, they have warning labels on those foods that have dyes. And here, it's in everything for our kids. And pesticides are literally poison. So we eat foods that have glyphosate or Roundup or pesticides sprayed on them all the time because none of it is regulated. And then there's this nightmare. So with COVID-19, our children are less physically active. They have increased stress. Obesity in the age group from five to 11 went from 32%, which was already horrifying, to 45% during COVID. How terrifying is that, that 45% of school-aged children in America are now considered obese? So is our food the same? You know, they really have done a lot of studies looking back, and I can say I am a child of the 70s. You know, I did not eat kale for, you know, three times a day. I was raised by a single mom. I, you know, we would have Susie Q's at our lunch and, you know, <laughs> canned ravioli, but, but was the food the same that was in those things? And, and no, you know, there's all these studies showing that our soil is, is dirt poor, that the soil that our food is grown in is nutrient depleted. So it doesn't have a lot of the minerals. It doesn't have as much nutritional value as it did say 30 to 40 years ago. So maybe the kid that ate processed food back then could make it to med school that even you know without exposure, but now it's just different nutrient poor food. So what are GMOs? You know, initially when, they, when I started hearing about GMOs, I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. That's like that old um, monk, you know, Gregor Mendel, who did the crossing of the peas, and he made peas taller and peas shorter. So why would it be bad to genetically alter, you know, food? And, and it's not necessarily bad in, in thought, but it's why it's becoming genetically altered. So really, um, this is my nemesis. So um, Roundup, initially in the 1960s, um, was used to clean pipes. And then Monsanto's, the company that owned it, decided, wait a minute, this kills weeds. Let's start you know, spraying it on fields and crops. But then it was killing the crops because it kills everything. So then they said, let's genetically alter the crops so that when you spray the Roundup, it kills everything around them except the crops. Well, now we've got food that's so hard to break down that Roundup doesn't kill it. And we're eating it. So we're eating something that's genetically altered to be very hard to digest and break down. And then we're hosing it with pesticides and chemicals. And there's not a whole lot of data because Monsanto is really, really powerful. But there is the Children's Health Defense Fund is an organization. Um, one of the Kennedy sons, their grandsons, was super involved in it where they did a lot of research about health implications related to Roundup. And the reality is our children are more susceptible to these neurotoxins, that they, it's cumulative. It, it's a uh, greater exposure. The places where they do have more data associated with, uh, of, um, associated with Roundup are the guys that work spraying it all the time. And that's, those are those cases out in California where, I mean, one lawn care worker, he made, I don't know, $238 million in a claim against Monsanto's because you have a 41% increased chance of cancer if you spray this stuff for a living. What does it say about how horrible that is? So why do GMOs and Roundup matter? Again, it makes your food difficult to digest if you genetically altered it. It's hosed in pesticides. And then the other thing is we have a gut biome, which I talk about, which is the good bacteria that live in the lower part of your intestine. And it's super important for health, especially mental health. But if you're eating a pesticide, it is killing your good gut bacteria. And the other kicker is, so our, our, one of the reasons our soil is dirt poor is that when you spray Roundup on it, Roundup binds to the minerals. So the good stuff that should be going into our food doesn't if it's not organic and if it's been sprayed with Roundup. So the first integrated conferences I went to, I was super judgy. And I would sit there and be like, oh, you know, where did they get these slides from? And, you know, I think that all this stuff is so manipulated. And, um, and so this slide was in all these talks where they talked about, you know, this is what 
the agricultural estimated use for Roundup is in 1994, and then this is what it looks like in 2017. So this is actually out of an EPA um, research article. So it's not something that's just made up by the tree hugging community. This is something that's very real and it's cumulative. So the more that Roundup is used in the soil and in our crops, the more it's accumulating in our, uh, in our country. And, and in Europe and other countries, they're very strict. You know, they don't allow you to genetically alter their food. They don't allow you to use glyphosate, and their food systems are much safer. So now we'll talk about our water. So water used to come out of mountain streams, which was lovely and, and wonderful, and would have all kinds of minerals. And um, and now, oops, in the wrong way. And so the minerals and the vitamins were in the water that we drank because it came off mountain streams. The problem they have now is that our water doesn't come from a mountain stream. Our water comes from reclaimed, it's often treated with um, chloramines, which is chlorine, which again can affect your gut biome. And then it's, uh, Aaron Brockovich did a big um, expose on St. Pete City Water five years ago, if you Google it, it's in there, about how they burst twice a year with these chemicals to kill extra things that they're worried may be in the city water, and then people have all these developmental problems, and no one cared, it was so sad but our water system is not healthy or good for us. So magnesium is one of the things that we're missing out on that should be in our soil and should be in our water. And what does magnesium do? It's so important for your body's function, but deficiency in it looks like the kids have hyperactivity and inattention and insomnia and constipation. And being the ADHD lady in town and having these kids, you know, how many happy hyper little boys I see running around that are four and five years old that the teachers send to me and are like, oh, you gotta do something. And I put them on some magnesium or I have them do Epsom salt baths and they get better and they don't need to go on Ritalin. And it really is, is powerful and amazing to kind of watch that happen. So does anyone know what I have nutritional lithium, why I have a seven up can? Anybody have any ideas? So um, seven up was actually initially had lithium in it. And it's called seven up because the atomic weight of, neut of lithium is 6.9. So that's why it became, that's why it was labeled seven up. But anyway, so lithium in small doses is normally in our food or especially in water sources. And it's really important. It's important for brain growth. It's important for brain development. It, it helps our brain to kind of heal and recover. I have a patient who has an inoperable brain stem tumor and when he takes his nutritional lithium a day, he doesn't have his headaches and it helps him. Um, but this is not lithium that's what we take when we're bipolar, which is 400 to 800 milligrams a day. This is one to four milligrams. I've noticed for years when I do low doses of lithium on my kids who have aggression, the aggression gets much better. And so they did studies um, where they looked at the countries where you still drank mountain-fed water um, all over the world. And the countries that had mountain-fed water with small amounts of nutritional lithium in them had much lower suicide rates than the countries that don't have it. So, simple but it's powerful but it's not in the sun that was like 1920 to 1938 so um, folate versus folic acid so they found out in the 1970s that women if you didn't have folate in your diet you were much more likely to have spina bifida so what they decided to do is put something called folic acid in a lot of processed meat. so a lot of the breads and a lot of the other things have something called folic acid added to it um, which in theory is good, because they're like, yay, let's have less spina bifida, let's do this, but it's not the same thing. So what they found over time is that folic acid, because it's a synthetic form of folate, as opposed to folate, which is what we get from leafy greens, can actually cause problems, especially for people who have something called an MTFHR. Who here has done like a 23andMe or done like the genetic testing? Yeah, so when you look at the 23andMe, it'll show MTFHR. So it's a very common genetic problem where people have difficulty doing something called methylation. And it's really important for neurologic health, for prevention of cancer. It's how methylation turns genes off as well as helps us clear dopamine and things from our brain. If people have ADHD, they take methylphenidate because it methylates and it helps dopamine to clear. So MTFHR is really important. But what they didn't realize is that folic acid actually is like sticky glue in your MTFHR. So if you already have a dysfunctional, either a two gene dysfunction MTFHR or even just one, and you eat a lot of synthetic or processed foods with that synthetic folic acid, you're going to muck up your MTFHR and you can have a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression type issues. So 
cleaning your MTFHR by eating things like leafy greens can actually help if you have that deficit or just globally to help with your body functions, having leafy greens and having good folate as opposed to folic acid. So I, because I kind of became the, uh, the ADHD lady in town, I say, if you build it, they will come. I kept seeing these kids, you know, initially it was just the kids within my practice at Fifth Ave, but then everybody just started coming to me. And, and it was the same sort of story. There were these little kids that would either have colic or they had eczema, they had food allergies when they were babies, and then they had some ear infections. And not every story was the same, but you could kind of feel it out. Or then they would turn on, around and their reflux was causing ear infections, and then they would have asthma, and then all of a sudden, after all the antibiotics, when they're five or six, they have learning differences, and they have ADHD. And you know, what I found as I went to these integrative conferences is that it's all food-based. You know, if you can figure out in these little babies what's causing that colic and that reflux and change their food and change what you're putting in their gut, a lot of times you can stop that progression that goes into, here's all the ear infections and here's all the ADHD or anxiety or whatever it leads down the road. So, um, so now food allergies and sensitivities. What, what can I eat? So this is very controversial, and this is a big divide between the traditional docs and the integrative docs. So allergies and sensitivities can cause gut inflammation. And initially when I went to these conferences, I was like, all right, this is the GI guys don't agree with you. This is just kind of all hooey, but I have seen it again and again and again. And I think what happens, you know, you have little kids that maybe they had blood in their stool when they were a baby, or maybe they had, you know, really bad colic, but then as they got older, they seemed to tolerate it. But I think what happens with these kids is that it looks different. That maybe instead of having hives and instead of having reflux, they just get inflammation in their gut that's causing reflux that they don't tell you about. I have all, I can't sound, I can't tell you how many times I would ask a kid, do you throw up in your mouth like, oh, all the time? And the parent would look over like, oh my God. And, just, they, they, that's their norm and they just don't know any better or the kid was constipated constantly and you figure out what they're sensitive to and you take it out and they can poop and they don't throw up in their mouth. Do I think these things are worse here because our food is sicker? Absolutely. I have a lot of kids that I take gluten out of their diet and I always think if you went to Europe you could probably eat the, the wheat or eat the bread in France or eat the wheat that's grown in Italy but the stuff that's here is different and it makes these kids sick and I have time and time again seen kids I have a patient she has bad juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and she is off gluten she has no drugs no medication she is completely symptom free and then she hangs out with her buddies and eats a bunch of pizza and she can barely walk so I really think it's an important thing to look at if if we're consuming certain foods that maybe we're sensitive to when we we're little and we're having these problems that they may be linked so signs of food sensitivities, digestive issues, reflux, constipation, skin involvement. I always say the skin is a reflection of your gut. If you can clean up your skin, you can clean up your, or if you can clean up your gut, you can clean up your skin. Even my, my patients with bad um, acne, a lot of times I'll talk to them about how, you know, just try to stay off the sugar. These kids love their garbage and they love their sugar. But the glycemic index, like when you shoot your insulin and when you have all these big surges of insulin, it makes your, your glands secrete more and you get all of this kind of waxy film. And then the dermatologists, which they're doing their best, a lot of times put them on topical antibiotic stuff for their skin and it kills their good gut bacteria. They actually have like probiotic sprays for your skin now that you can put, put good bacteria back on your skin. And I see kids get better um, with that just from acne. But respiratory issues, psychological issues, I, I can't emphasize enough how many kids I've seen again and again that when you change their diet, their psychiatric issues get better. And then everyone is unique. This was sort of my point about integrated medicine at the beginning, that instead of treating everyone as like a group or as a whole, every single person is, is unique. In autism, they came out with, I don't know, 20 years ago, that everybody should be on gluten and dairy-free diet. So every kid with autism, they took away dairy and gluten, and it worked for some, but a lot of them it didn't, and it's because some weren't you know, gluten and dairy sensitive. So it's it's determining exactly what your sensitivities are. What are the foods that bother you? What are the foods that we need to stay away from? And, and sometimes it's something kind of random that you're not consuming as much that you think you are, but it's different. So leaky gut, again, this is another debate between integrated medicine and um, traditional medicine, because traditional medicine feels like this isn't as prevalent as it is 
but it is, and I see it all the time. So the concept of what leaky gut is, is that we're exposing things into our intestine or body, either food or medications or whatever exposure, the glyphosate that's on the food, and it's causing inflammation in our gut. So this is like a cross section of your intestine that looks at the little cells in your intestine, and those exposures are causing them to open up. And so what happens is then the things that are in our gut that are not healthy for us, either yeast or bacteria or the medications we're putting in or the glyphosate we're exposed to can actually go into your bloodstream or affect your nerves. And, uh, and we get through. And the interesting thing is everyone thinks that your brain is sort of a one-way connection. So your brain makes your gut move and your heart beat and all those things and that's being the vagus nerve. But what they found is it's bi-directional that actually the things in our gut can travel back up the vagus nerve and affect our brain. And the same thing, if we have leaky gut, they can go into our circulation and go and affect our brain by getting into the circulation that surrounds our brain. So the gut bio. This is really kind of a newer thing. I mean, most of you have probably heard of it, but if the gut biome is so important and it's really, really, really important for parents to understand this concept as well with young kids because I think that a lot of what they eat and they get exposed to is kind of killing this. But there are more bacteria in the gut biome, in the cells, in your large intestine, um, trillions that make up the cells in your body. So these creatures that live in our large intestine are, are more, there's more of them than what make our entire body and they are so, so important. Uh, and I, when I do these talks, I always say, look, every time your kid has like a runny nose for four or five days, and you're like, oh, they can't miss any school, and I need to get them into the doctor. We just need an antibiotic. No, that when they take it, if they don't need it, it's killing a lot of our friends in our lower intestine. It's going to cause yeast to overgrow, and it's going to kill those good gut bacteria. So we want to be cautious about what we're exposed to in terms of pesticides or chemicals or antibiotics if we don't need them because it can destroy our gut biome. And this, I'm going to quiz everybody on this later. Um, so, um, and this, I always do these, I always do these presentations of my husband and my son to just see how much they roll their eyes and how bored they are. And my husband and son are like, "What's up with that slide, mom?" And I'm like, "I know, I know, I know." But it's important because it just shows you what these bacteria do. They protect, so they're part of your immune system. They actually synthesize vitamins. Our body can make vitamins if our gut flora is healthy. It can't make minerals. That's why we need our minerals. But it can make vitamins, and that's amazing. So it can help um, intestinal growth of um, angiogenesis is of blood vessels. It's important with fat storage. It's important with synthesis of glucose and your modulation of your nervous system. So really, I can't emphasize enough how much you sort of want to protect your child's gut biome by feeding it the healthy foods as well as trying to keep away from the things that will kill these good gut bacteria. So why does it all matter? Because inflammation can cause leaky gut, it disrupts our immune system, it causes change in our gut bacteria, and then signals travel from our gut up to our brain via the vagus nerve or through our circulation system. And the end result, I mean, our, our kids are sick. I mean, there's 6.1 million kids diagnosed with ADHD from ages 2 to 17, 4.4 million of 3 to 17 diagnosed with anxiety, and 2 million with depression. That is a lot of kids with mental health issues, and I think food is an important aspect of these, these issues. So what can we do? I, I really, really think, and I'm gonna go through sort of the pillars of nutritional psychiatry, I really think as much as you possibly can to eat organic. Dr. Logue posted on our like little website, you know, the dirty dozen, the foods that are more likely to cheat. I, I think try to eat as clean and organic as you can all the time. I think that life state is cumulative and it affects it. Honestly, once you start eating organic and clean most of the time, you notice it in food. I would have um, eggs every morning and my husband just picked up eggs somewhere and they were not organic and it tasted like chicken poop. I mean, they were so <laughs> gross. And that's because those chickens that are trapped in those little cages eat chicken feces. I mean, you, your food is going to reflect what that animal consumed. So the nutritional psychiatry pillars. So these are sort of the rules to go by if you want to follow the concepts of nutritional psychiatry. So be whole and eat whole. I tell kids every day, all the time in my office, that your food should look like you pulled it out of the ground or hit it over the head. And they'll be like, what do you have for breakfast? I'm like, a Pop-Tart. So, so really, and, and it's, it's not appropriate to assume that a kid's gonna go from eating Pop-Tarts and eating processed garbage food all the time to all of a sudden, oh no, I just want my organic oat 
portfolio with like three different kinds of vegetables and fruit. So, but but you try, and I think giving them rules and then setting good examples that we live by them as well. So the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of what we eat is whole food and then 20% is kind of the other stuff just because that's what we're all sort of accustomed to. Eat the rainbow. There's a great Instagram account by a nutritionist called Kids Eat in Color, and she has suggestions. Because it's hard. It's hard when your kids have kind of been raised eating other types of things. And I tell parents all the time, put a little rainbow on your fridge or put one in your kitchen and say to your kids, okay, let's eat a rainbow every day. What did you eat that's each color? So let's say for breakfast we had a banana and some blueberries. So we had yellow and we had blue. How can we have green? How can we have orange? How, where can we fit that in? And it makes it more fun. It makes it more playful. But it gives them an idea. And then explain. We need to do that because our body needs all these vitamins and all these minerals and from all different sources. But trying to make it sort of more fun and engaging. The greener the better. What I was talking about with folic acid and, and, uh, and folate is really important. So encouraging cups of leafy greens, you know, trying to incorporate them. I think with kids, they get taste better than they do texture. You know, broccoli and kale are not the best things to have texturally, but sort of figuring it out. I know some kids won't eat kale if you put it in a salad, but if you make kale chips and it's crunchy and it has a little sea salt on it, they'll eat it. But trying to incorporate more greens or put them in, my son the other day I made chili, and I was like, do you want me to make a salad with that too? And he's like, there's salad in your chili. <laughs> there was, there's kale in it, which I'll eat a kale salad, I'm just being lazy. But, but it's just trying to incorporate those really nutrient-dense foods in the things that they eat is really important. And then have conversations with your kids. You know, how do you feel after you eat certain foods? I mean, they're all going to say they love sugar because they get that pie or they get that rush, but how do you feel two hours afterwards? I mean, you have the rush, you feel the oh, and then you feel bad. I mean, it chews up your... Um, insulin so that it bottoms out your blood sugar but like talk to them you know how do you feel like when you go to soccer practice if you have apps with peanut butter as opposed to if you have you know a junky piece of cookie or something that's really sugary but have a conversation about how food makes them feel and how they sort of process it and try to make them more body or self-aware ask them if they feel like they throw up in their mouth i had one girl she had horrible reflux at soccer and she was drinking gatorade with dye in it and i was like I think Gatorade is causing your reflux. So trying to have them listen to their bodies and give feedback about how foods make them feel. And the other, you know, my tricks for getting kids to try veggies, like I said, you can sneak them in. I love, love a smoothie. So trying to make smoothies if they like, most kids will eat fruit. So if they like their blueberries and their bananas, well then throw a handful of kale in or throw some, you know, carrot puree in. And then my other trick with uh, smoothies is if they don't drink it because it's expensive to buy all these vegetables, mix it, make them into popsicles. Kids will always have popsicles. You freeze them all into those little handmade popsicles. They come home from school, oh, here, I'll have a popsicle. And they eat two servings of fruits and vegetables and they're popsicles. Grow, grow, grow your food. So my husband and I, we are big gardeners. Like we were talking on that first slide about Venison Farm. I spent my weekend planting my peas and my collard greens and my beans, but um, I think growing your own food is the best way to know where it comes from, and I think it's a really great way to get kids to eat stuff, is if they're part of it. That is an um, example of an earth box. Does everybody here know what an earth box is? Does anybody here know what an earth box is? Okay. So earth boxes are awesome. If you are not a gardener, if you don't have a green thumb, these are pretty convenient food. I mean, they are great things, and especially my backyard is mainly pavers and pool. So earth boxes are a huge part of what we grow, but they're self-contained systems that you can buy organic ones that you get organic um, dirt to go in it, and then they give you dolomite, which is packed with vitamins. So it's really high in calcium and magnesium and all those vitamins and, and nutrient-rich um, uh, minerals that we desperately need in our kids. So you, you fill the box up, and then you can put seedlings in or you can grow seedlings, which is super fun for kids to do anyway. But because that little box is so nutrient dense, you put the little plastic thing over it and then the condensation kind of holds it. You never have to weed it, which is magical. And then you just pour water in the tube that sticks out of the, out of the side twice a week. And they grow and have huge yield. The first time we did an earth box, we grew kale for eight months in this $160 earth box. So it's just something to do with your children that will get them more engaged in eating so the good news is, you know, children's brains, just like they're more susceptible to these things, you can change this. And I see it all the time, especially in my new practice, that you know, I have more time to educate and I have more time to help people kind of navigate nutritional issues. But you can see a difference when you start taking some of these bad things away and putting some of the good things in their diet. 
So deficiencies in kids can be corrected, and a lot of the neurologic symptoms that they have and the problems they have, you can make them better at a young age because their brains are still growing and adaptable. And, you know, as a society, we have resources. You know, we're not in third world countries, which is interesting because in third world countries, it's actually easier to get um, homegrown or better food, and then they tend to eat um, a little bit better than we do, sadly, because the processed food is often more expensive, whereas in our country, the poorest people eat the worst food. I, for church, would always go to the uh, dollar store to buy crafts for Sunday school, and I would see people using their EBT cards to buy ramen noodles and Kool-Aid, and I'd be like, that's what that kid's eating today, and it's a big reason why the poorest in our country are, are the sickest. So, so I just said that's such a depressing story. But anyway, um, I think that's my last slide. So.
but just portion size, like what our expectations are. That's why everybody gets mad when they go to Europe because they get these small portion size, but that's sort of what we should be eating. And we just have this skewed perspective. Mm -hmm. Do you consult any private schools or any schools on their food in the cafeteria, like the menu choices? Because in Europe, they do have that nutritionist doctor that they meet with the school and the cafeteria people to get their menus approved on what the kids are eating. Is that? Yeah, I'm, I'm super busy um, with my <laughs> practice, so I don't. You know, I think with school, lunch programs, it's hard because it's what the options are out there. I mean, there's no restaurants in St. Pete that you can go to that are all organic. It is really hard in America. And I know my grocery bill with a big 17 year old who eats a lot is about 500 bucks a week because I eat all clean and organic and we grow a bunch of our stuff. So it is really hard to, to feed a school or to find a lunch program that's gonna be all organic and clean. So um, so I'm not sure, I, I, I have no doubt that they do that in Europe and I would love to live there. Can I just say that with Sage, which is our food service, they do have nutritionists as part of their team, and they would welcome Jeremy Simpkins, who's the director of dining services, can put any parent in touch with the nutritionist to work with the Sage program to talk about options. And they also have an app that you can actually pull it up and look at the nutritional of every item that they serve. So it's certainly worth it. That's something you're interested in. Where do you shop? So I love Rolling Oats. Rolling Oats is my home away, and my son works at the produce section in public, so I have to go there too. <laughs> uh, but, but I can tell you, yeah. But I can tell you that they're tricky because Greenwise is not organic. Right. Greenwise just means that they're not feeding, you know, the animals, animals, which is just disgusting. But you know, just because it says it's Greenwise does not mean it's organic. It's different labels, and especially when you're buying the um, chicken, if you look like the Greenwise label means it's fed. The animals are fed an all vegetarian diet, but they're still fed. Um, plants that have been treated with glyphosate. So it's not that it's Roundup clean unless it says actually organic or the USDA, you know, green stamp organic is what's truly organic. Uh, go. Oh, go ahead. Oh, thanks. How about the health risks of dairy? I, I didn't hear anything Health risks of dairy? Because I don't, my personal feeling is that if you're not sensitive to dairy, I don't think dairy is a problem. So I think that's why everyone is unique and everyone is, like in my household, my son and I don't consume, you know, gluten and dairy, we do better. I would say we're gluten and dairy free and my husband's gluten and dairy full, <laughs> which is not necessarily good for him. But I think there are lots of people who can consume dairy now. Do I think it's better to have organic grass-fed dairy? Absolutely, but there are people who consume dairy and I don't think, do I think it's the same as back in the day where everybody had to have their three cups of milk in order to get all their calcium? Not necessarily. I think you can get your calcium through leafy greens and I think your bones, vitamin D is super important for bone development. So that I think has changed, um, but I don't think that dairy is bad for everybody. Thanks, kidding. I have two, two questions, that's all right. The only time I put my hand up though. Um, the first one is about uh, athletes, student athletes. What should they eat before, during, if anything, and after a game? And the second one's just a personal one about vitamins for adults, particularly those who are vegetarians. What type, what was the end of the second question about vitamins, vitamins for those? adults, do you recommend them? So, um, I recommend vitamins for everybody because I don't think the food here is okay. going to give you everything that you need. So for athletes, I know my son is a basketball player. Um, I think that protein, again, is important. I think having carbohydrates that are healthy carbohydrates, like fruits, vegetables, like I know before my son um, has big games, so usually he gets like fresh kitchen where he has a meat protein and has like several um, vegetables mixed in with it, and then some starches, because you need to have starches, but try to have real healthy starches, like sweet potatoes, as opposed to potato chips. So um, so I think having sort of a balanced meal, and then I think when they're performing, you know, for that first hour, they really just need water, and then after that, they probably need some type of electrolytes. Um, it depends on the sport, whether or not they can consume something with protein. Certainly if you're on a soccer field and you're running and playing, you're gonna throw up if you try to eat something that has too much fat or protein. So it's kind of sport specific um, and depends on the length of time that they perform. Most healthy kiddos, if you feed them a good balanced meal, at least an hour beforehand, and they drink water while they compete, they're fine. So. Pasta, pasta is a, as a pre-game thing. That's often what the, you read the blog sites, a lot of professionals eat pasta and breads. And is that? No. Oh, pasta and bread and starch loading? I don't think so. No, I, I mean, yeah, and that's gotten away. I mean, actually, if you look at like Kyrie Irving and, and LeBron James and all those guys, I mean, they've cleaned their diet. I mean, most of these premier athletes find out. And, and Tom Brady, 
you have broken my heart that you are now selling Subway. Because oh. forever I use that guy as an example. So when he ate Subway in college, he was a sixth round draft choice. Now his diet is pristine. He has his all organic, 75% is fruits, vegetables, clean, clean, clean with clean, lean proteins, um, uh, salmon and just high, high yield proteins. And the guy is at 44, amazing, like the best quarterback of all time. And it's his diet that has to do with that. So when kids are like, oh, I need to eat a big bowl of pasta right before it, I'm like, Tom, Tom Brady doesn't eat any gluten. He just sells Subway, which like I said, kills me. So. Thank you, thanks very much. <laughs> he has so much money, shame on him. So. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, excellent talk. Um, can you talk about kind of frequency of eating? You know, we've gotten to a point where kids are eating like eight times a day, especially when you add in all the, you know, Gatorade and sugar beverages <laughs> and stuff. And I think it's related to the, you know, nutritional deficiencies in the food. So um, I think, well, I think it's related to the sugar. You know, because when you have sugar, your blood sugar, that's why like everybody who gives their kid a starchy, snacky food or sugary food before they go to bed, they don't sleep well blood sugar goes up and then blood sugar goes down. And you wake up, you can't sleep. So yeah, I think kids, I think everybody should eat three portion appropriate meals a day with maybe a couple of nutritional snacks in between. But yeah, our kids graze all the time. My niece used to come and, and my, my stay with us when she was little and my sister-in-law and my brother would be like, she doesn't eat, she doesn't eat. And it's like, cause she drank like juice all day and just ate like goldfish. I'm like, why would I have any juice or goldfish? That kid ate like a horse for me. But it's just, she was so used to. So it's getting them away from the fact that no, I don't need to, one, you shouldn't be running around eating. That was like my big thing. I had some song that I used to sing to my son, if you were eating, you were sitting and, and he hated it. <laughs> but, um, but it's true because they were running around and trying to shove food in their mouth. You really should sit down, you should process your food, you should chew your food. That's all part of digestion and that's all part of health. But yeah, our kids just graze all day and it's usually not good stuff. So. Because what you can get on the go is usually garbage. Yeah, I mean, so I like, I take, and this is not a, you know, I'm not practicing medicine, I'm just giving informational stuff. I can tell you I like the Garden of Life uh, products. I think they're clean and they usually are helpful and they have all those kind of little bits of um, extra minerals that some of the like one a day in Centrum don't have. So the Garden of Life products are pretty clean. So, and I think probiotics are really important too because what we're killing in our gut biome, some of the probiotics will get back. But again, you should all talk to your doctors and get their you know, opinion of what they think and what they recommend. Yes. Do um, you have tips on helping kids make choices when they're not in the company of their parents, like young kids, you know, between the ages of three and 10, how do we help them make choices that are good for their body when they have so many other choices in front of them throughout the day? Well, I think those are conversations. You know, I talk, I talk, when I spoke to the teachers, um, I was talking about trying to keep, teach our kids self-regulation, like instead of a time out corner, a time in corner, where you kind of, how do I feel? And then how do I, what's a healthy way to show how I feel? And I think, you know, if, if within the confines of your home, they're having healthy choices and making healthy choices and they like those choices, have conversations and say, you know, when you're at your friends, and, and you kind of know like which houses are gonna have these choices and which houses won't. And the, it's trying to navigate it as best you can, but have a conversation when you eat that, and how do you feel, or how do you how do you think that treats your body? So trying to educate them is really the best way to protect them, because ultimately they're gonna go off to college, they're gonna eat whatever they want, but if you provide sort of that foundation within your home, and you educate your child as much as you can, then your hope is they're gonna start going for healthier choices or one of those things. It's a hard thing, because our diet's so normal. Any other questions? Food sensitivity testing. How do you go about that? Do you just do an elimination diet? Is there actual like tests? So there are you specialists. Do? You can talk to your primary care provider, but there are, if you look in our community, there are allergists that will um, do testing that they do like your back skin testing. And what they read is instead of the control, which is when they do a histamine, like if you have ever had your um, back testing, what they do is they put a histamine, which everybody gets a red well from. And then they look at whatever's above it, but some of the docs in town will actually look to see what's below it. So where you still sort of have inflammation. So that's an op uh, that's um, one of the opportunities. Or you just look and you know can do elimination. It's hard to do elimination diets with children because they really don't like it. it feels like you're punishing them to take something they love out of their diet when they're not sure it makes them feel bad. But I think having conversations with the kid where 
they're like, does this make you throw up in your mouth? Do you feel bad after you eat this? And sometimes it will guide them to be like, well, let's just try. Let's see if you feel a little bit better if you stay away from them. So. And how long does something stay in their system? Like typically, like my daughter has a little bit of eczema on her on her wrist, and it's just like a little spot. And I have been telling her it's because of sugar, and she has a sweet tooth. And, and so she said to me, she's like, Mom, I ate so good today. You know, she would have a little bit of sugar, and then I'm like, okay, you've got to cut back. And so then she's like, I ate so good today. You're wrong. I still have this. I'm like, well, it takes time. <laughs> so for food sensitivities and elimination, I think dairy, um, if they do have sensitivity to dairy within a month, you can kind of tell. Like okay. if it'll feel different or when they eat it again, they'll notice food and it can take like eight months. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it takes a lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about uh, kids with food allergies and then doing the challenges where they have food allergies with allergies? pushing to say, well, you'll be able to eat these foods, even though you have a sensitivity, if you challenge it, you know, and over time, you know, your allergy will go away by exposure. I mean, what is your thought? So I did that with my son. My son had an anaphylactic reaction to egg when he was little, and then we did the desensitization, and then I fed him eggs, and then he had horrible reflexes as he got older, and he doesn't eat eggs anymore. So um, I think that it's still there, it just looks different. So I, I think, you know, some people will do the peanut desensitization, which, you know, if peanuts are gonna kill you and you're gonna go on a plane and somebody opens a thing of peanuts and you're gonna, then maybe it's worth doing the desensitization, but I wouldn't keep putting it in your body. Like there's a reason why your body sort of rejected this in the first place. So I'm not a big fan of that, so. Yep. Is the takeaway that we should be avoiding tap water altogether? I would, okay, yeah. I mean, I, I buy those big Zephyr Hills jugs and then I make collard green back to grease. Thanks when he's working, he loves that. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I think spring water is so much healthier and and yeah. So you can get water purifiers that will take a lot of the stuff out, but it's not gonna have the good stuff in. But again, I think you know, trying to buy more organic, growing some of your food, you know, supplementation will give you back some of those minerals. But yeah, I don't think tap water is a good thing. I think water's good. Thank you, Dr. Cross. We really appreciate it. Thanks for taking on this.